so uh, good good evening everyone uh, i am saurav uh, i am a phd scholar from iit roper so i have been assigned as a ta uh, for this course that is uh, design of reinforced concrete structures uh, for this semester so the mandate for me uh, is to help you in problem solving uh, be briefly through uh, uh, discussing the weekly uh, course content and also help you in solving the assignment problems okay so this is what i will be focusing uh, in my lectures uh, for the entire semester so let us uh, begin then so uh, this is the uh, first week lecture notes so basically i will be initially trying to uh, give you a brief summary of the course content uh, which uh, had been provided to you uh, for the first week uh, and similarly for every week and there thereafter i will be helping you uh, for, while solving the assignments and we will discuss okay so yeah so let us start then uh, what is basically concrete uh, concrete is basically uh, we can say a uh, mixture of aggregate in mortar okay so mortar basically is uh, cement plus fine aggregate and aggregate i am referring to is basically the coarse aggregate okay so it is a mixture of mortar uh, that is cement fine aggregate which is mixed uh, with water water is acting as the liquid uh, at a medium of mixture and there uh, it is actually this is a paste and this mortar paste is actually uh, mixed in aggregate or if i say coarse aggregate is mixing this mortar paste okay so this is basically a mixture so uh, as you can see uh, this is the casting uh, going on as you can see here and uh, if we insert reinforcements uh, in concrete uh, while casting say in beam column or any other structural uh, specimens so that is uh, that becomes reinforced concrete okay rcc okay reinforced cement concrete so here if you see uh, the distance of the rebar okay, we are just discussing uh, we will go into uh, detail in the coming weeks in the coming lectures so if you see here uh, the edge the distance from the edge to the end of the the inner outermost end of the bar is it is basically called the clear cover or also the nominal cover and if we add half the diameter it is also known as the effective cover okay and these are some of the uh, bar sizes which are present uh, in market so uh, for say for example uh, if we if uh, if we consider this to be a plan of a building okay which is having uh, say 2 by 2 base okay base means uh, this one uh, individual uh, square okay so this is basically a room okay so if we see here it is 2 by 2 meaning uh, there is two base uh, in x direction as well as two base in y direction okay so if we consider this drawing we will find that these lines basically which are been shown straight lines these are basically the beams okay and these small squares if you can see these are basically the columns okay and these white spaces if we consider uh, these are basically the slabs okay and everything will be reinforced concrete okay so we can say the base of 5 by 5, uh, 5 meter plus 5 meter that is 10 meter similar in this direction also so this is just a schematic diagram uh, representation so we will go into very detail uh, in the coming lectures okay so uh, as you can see here also this is uh, you know before concreting uh, we need to initially uh, fix the reinforcements okay for beam columns slabs etc so this is mainly the rebar cage arrangement which is done before concreting all you uh, most of you must have seen this uh, inside at construction site so this is similarly uh, the fixing of column rebar cage arrangement before concreting so here these are the longitudinal uh, main reinforcement and these are the secondary reinforcement Uh, which in column case it's called the tie bars and in beams it is called the stirrups okay so this is mainly used for uh, preventing the shear uh, for providing strength against shear or lateral loading okay so as you as i told you so these are the tie bars uh, and uh, in case of column it is called tie bar in case of beam it is called stirrup basically it is the same and we have to design for this also uh, which we will be again uh, you know discussing in the coming classes and the the spacing is basically uh, we we can, we have to uh, design and find out and this is important because to prevent this okay so if this uh, is this is not present uh, these columns uh, the reinforcement they can buckle out this is known as buckling okay so this can buckle out so to prevent this or to provide the shear lateral strength we mainly provide the tie bars okay so uh, these are some of the pictures uh, which are self explanatory where uh, they have used construction in construction they have uh, you know uh, cast the slab okay they have uh, put the reinforcement caging and these are the props and cantilever uh, props and formworks okay for the concreting so similar is 
are the examples as you can see so these are the props and uh, formworks as you can see so similarly they have cast and still because it has not set completely they have used the props of it so similar uh, are the, these are some of the uh, pictures live pictures of uh, at site uh, like uh, this will give you an idea uh, how it is been done so basically uh, these are 150 mm cubes okay uh, which are basically uh, used for finding the compressive strength uh, in uh, such machine which is called a compressive testing machine and this is the scale uh, where you can find out the strength okay uh, or the pressure applied so this is the test which is performed uh, in order to find out the compressive strength and as you can see here uh, this uh, beam uh, this cube has failed in compression as you can see so uh, uh, you know, uh, this if you consider this, uh, this is a, a setup. I think it is a this one a tensile uh, testing setup. Okay, so various uh, tests are done. Okay, to find out the behavior of concrete. So this is uh, again is the um, uh, you know detailed view. Okay, so this is maximized view. So and uh, this I think it is a uh, this one uh, cylindrical uh, testing machine. Uh, I think it is universal testing machine. Okay. So yeah, so basically for this concrete uh, reinforced, uh, this one design of reinforced concrete structure course, we basically will be uh, using some of the codes, okay? Uh, basic, uh, very few basic codes are there, okay? Uh, which we will be concentrate, uh, we will concentrate upon. So one of them, the primary one is uh, is the IS456-2000, okay? So that is basically the code for plain and reinforced concrete, okay? So that is the, the main code, okay? Apart from that, apart from that, uh, we will be uh, using IS 875 Part One. Okay, so that is basically the code of practice for design loads. Okay, other than earthquake, so this Part One is basically the dead load. Okay, so dead load. So we have to consider this code. Then there is 1893, which is a famous code in earthquake. Okay, so this is the uh, earthquake code. Part One is mainly for the buildings. Okay, general provisions and buildings. So this is the criteria for earthquake resistant design of structures. Then there is this code, uh, code uh, this this is uh, 875 part 5, okay. Uh, so this was 875 part 1 which was mainly for dead load and this is part 5 which is basically for special load and combination. Because uh, in buildings, uh, the main loads which we have to take into account is dead load, live load, uh, earthquake load and wind load, okay. So these are like, like the main loads which we take into consideration, okay. Other loads are also there, but that is not of that significance. So these four are the main loads. So for that combination, uh, we basically refer to this code. Okay. So as I mentioned you, so these are the four main co uh, loads which we will be considering in our design. That is the dead load, live load. Live load is also called as the imposed load. Okay. Then wind load, earthquake load. Okay. And these are the type of combinations which we have to, you know. Uh, calculate and find out so we will be going comprehensively uh, in the coming lectures okay so this that was all about first lecture okay so second uh, let us enter the second lecture so uh, that will be we will be mainly speaking about materials so basically concrete is as we dis just discussed it, a mix it is a mixture of coarse aggregate fine aggregate cement and water okay at appropriate pro proportions okay and that proportions can be, uh, you know, uh, can be designed as per, uh, can be, you know, mixed as per nominal, that is hand by just manual, you know, uh, just by having some lump sum idea, okay, like taking 1 is to 2 is to 4 ratio or something, or it can be done by a much, uh, you know, uh, much uh, proper or uh, an uh, accurate des uh, design, okay, so which is called the design mix, okay, so they are quote for design mix also. So like this, uh, the concrete is done. Okay. So mainly we are focusing on design of reinforced concrete. Okay. But if you go into material and this string uh, per, uh, perspective, so it is better to do design mix as compared to nominal mix. So it is all about uh, you know uh, finding out the proper behavior. So when we talk about material, okay, so there are a few of in few important terms, okay, in concrete which which we have to take into consideration. So one of them, it is the workability, okay? So workability is, uh, you know, uh, there are many definitions, okay? So it is very difficult to find one proper definition, but there are many definitions which we will go into. 
So workability is basically a concrete uh, which can be ready, readily compactable. It is said, uh, it is called workable, okay? Or it is the you know ability to work with concrete without you know uh, setting or you know uh, change in behavior. So the amount of uh, also it can be said to be the amount of useful internal work necessary to produce full compaction. That can also be a definition. As per the ASTM, uh, that is the American uh, Society for Testing and Materials. So uh, as per them, they have framed the definition to be the property determining the effort required to manipulate a freshly mixed quantity of concrete with minimum loss of homogeneity. Okay. So this is a standard definition coined by the ASTM people. Okay. As per ACI, that is American Concrete Institute, uh, as per them, the workability means a uh, property of freshly mixed concrete or mortar, which determines the ease and homogeneity with which it can be mixed, placed, consolidated, and finished. Okay. So as per ACI, this is the uh, definition of workability. Okay. So that is basically or workability. There are lots of definitions, but uh, if I say you the general, it is like the ability to work with uh, concrete uh, without setting or, you know, uh, without change in behavior okay, or strength. So that is basically workability. Now let us see what is consistency. So as per uh, consistent, as per uh, American Concrete Institute, cons consistency can be defined as the relative mobility or ability of freshly mixed concrete or mortar to flow. Okay, So it is the ability of the, uh, the mortar, okay, basically to flow. Okay, or even if when mixed with aggregate, it will become concrete. Okay, so it is the ability of concrete or mortar to flow, and that basically is measured by slump. Okay, so slump is one of the important parameter uh, which defines consistency. So uh, yeah, so consistency is measured by slump, and also workability. Also, uh, it is extensively used. Uh, the slump test is extensively used to measure workability even. Okay, inside work all over the world because it is quite easy. Okay. There are many other methods also, but they are seldom used. And also for the type of, uh, you know, uh, for the type of uh, the, the type of concrete which we are preparing, the slump test is quite sufficient. Okay. If we go for some other like, you know, self-compacting concrete or, you know, high strength concrete, there maybe we might require some other types of methods, but those are beyond our scope. Okay. Beyond the scope of this course and also beyond our scope of uh, reinforced concrete design. So we... Uh, it's better to avoid those, okay? So for our purpose, slump test is the main test which is used for workability and consistency. So slump test, uh, it is basically the here, uh, it is a test where the mole, okay? Uh, there is a mole, okay? Which is having dimension uh, of, uh, it is basically the mole is of, uh, of the shape of a frustum of a cone, okay? And it has a, a height of 300 mm. And it's uh, uh, there, to, as we know, in uh, in a frustum cones first uh, frustum there are two diameters, okay, one at the top and one at the bottom. So the bottom one is the one having the larger diameter, uh, which is basically 20, 200 mm, and the upper one uh, it is having the smaller opening or the diameter, which is around 10 centimeter. So this is below is 20 centimeter, 20, 200 mm, and above is 100 mm, okay. And it is filled with concrete in three layers of equal volume. Okay, so this is the shape of the uh, this one, uh, the fr uh, frustum of of the cone. Okay, as you can see, so this is 10 mm, this is 200, uh, sorry, 10 centimeter, this is 20 centimeter, and this is 30 centimeter. Okay, 100 mm, 200 mm, 300 mm. Okay, so uh, as you can see here, concrete is poured here. Okay, and then it is lifted using this by hands. Okay, so <laughs> Uh, the concrete was poured like this it filled the shape and when it was lifted it ch changed its shape okay so it was like this but when we lifted the cone it deformed into like this okay so this uh, the, this deformation basically this deformation is basically called as the slump okay how much was the slump this is the value okay so uh, as i told you uh, the preparation of concrete can be done by both nominal mix as well as uh, design mix nominal mix is basically taking a uh, you know, roundabout figure uh, of uh, proportions of various materials and mixing it. Okay, so it has been found widely that uh, if we take one is to two is to four ratio of cement, sand, and aggregate. Okay, so one is to two is to four of cement, sand, and aggregate, we get a strength of M15. So M basically, uh, actually, this is a wrong interpretation. So when we write M, it basically signifies mixed design. Okay, but it is just for you know the demonstration. It has been written. So M is basically mixed design. It should not be used in nominal mix, but uh, this 15 is basically the compressive strength, okay? 15 megapascal. 
the 28 day compressive strain. So it has been found if we take semen sand and aggregate at 1 is to 2 is to 4 ratio, we will get 15 megapascal compressive strain. Similarly, if we take 1 is to 1.5 is to 3 ratio uh, semen sand aggregate, we will get 20 megapascal after 28 days. And if we take 1 is to 1 is to 2, it will it will be around 25 megapascal. Okay. So this is as per uh, wide use of uh, as per wide use and uh, experience of people working in concrete. Okay, concrete industry. So they have uh, they have uh, widely accepted that if we take these proportions, we will get this 28 day uh, compressive strength basically. So yeah. So <clears throat> let us uh, focus on workability. So as we discussed, the workability is mainly uh, measured by slump. Okay. So we can define workability based on the various slumps developed. Okay. So if there is no slump, so it is definitely zero, no deformation. If the slump is 5 to 10 mm, it means very low workability. If it is between 15 to 30 uh, mm, it is low workability. If it is 35 to 75, it is medium. If it is 80 to 155, high and greater than 160, it is very high. Okay. So generally, ideally, we design for medium, okay, medium slump and medium workability. Uh, apart from some special, uh, you know, cases, okay. So there we may go for higher or lower, but otherwise we are mainly medium, okay. We consider mainly medium, that is 35 to 75 mm slump uh, concrete we basically design for, okay. So uh, apart from that, uh, there is also one more aspect which is called the durability, okay. So what is durability? So concrete should maintain its required strength and serviceability during the expected service life. So basically whatever we are doing now, workability, slump and all, these are all fresh tests, okay? We are doing just after concreting, okay? So this is fresh, okay? Uh, fresh or, you know, early, early stage, okay? Uh, but how to find out the behavior of uh, this one, uh, of the concrete at the later stage, say after 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, okay? So that is service life, okay? So the life expected life basically. Okay? So it is that therefore the durability aspect is also important. So the concrete should maintain its required strength and serviceability during the expected service life. And the concrete is said to be durable, okay, if it withstands the process of deterioration to which it can be expected to expose. Okay? So durability is basically the capability of concrete to withstand the process of deterioration to which it can be expected to expose. Okay. So mainly, uh, you know, deterioration deterioration will be mainly occurring because of corrosion or some attacks, okay? Say sulfate attack, okay? Nitrate attack. So various at chloride attack. So various attacks, uh, you know, lead to corrosion and uh, and even rusting, okay? So that is one of the main problem. So all those uh, uh, all those attacks uh, re result in det uh, deterioration of the concrete. And that will ultimately, uh, you know, hamper the strength and serviceability. So, you know, uh, the uh, the durability is basically uh, the capability to withstand those or the time till which it can withstand, okay, uh, the number of years. That is basically durability. So, yeah. So, now let us come to the standard uh, parameters, which basically is important in concrete, okay. So, one is compressive strength, okay. So, compressive strength is basically, uh, you know, uh, it is measured at after 28 days, okay, and that is measured in either cubes, which is you know done here, okay, 150 mm, or you or it is done uh, in cylinders, okay, which is done in US and all, okay. So there uh, they uh, they basically uh, they use diameter of 150 mm. Uh, they they basically prepare uh, concrete mold. Uh, they prepare, they cast concrete in molds of diameter 150 mm and height 300 mm, okay. And then they perform the compressive strength as we showed in the as I showed in the slides. And during the 20 day days before testing, the cubes and cylinders are stored under water, okay, or that is called curing, or placed in constant temperature room, and okay, uh, that is uh, we can say it to be a steam curing or something like that. Uh, placed in constant temperature room, maintained at 100% relative humidity. So 100% relative humidity is almost water, okay, water like conditions. So uh, these are some, you know, depiction of stress strain curves, as you can see. So, uh, you know, this is uh, this is high strength, uh, you know, because it has a high stress. But, uh, uh, you know, as, as the stress, stress increases, the strain decreases. Okay? So that, that is a relation. And by taking the tangent or, uh, you know, second modulus, we take the, uh, we find out the EC value. Okay. So that is how uh, the elastic modulus is found basically in compressive strength, uh, in uh, concrete. 
so yeah so what is tensile string uh, that is compressive string okay now what uh, let us study about tensile string so you know concrete is basically very good in tension uh, compression uh, but very bad in tension okay so it is observed from experimental studies that the tensile strength of concrete is highly variable okay and it ranges from approximately approximately 8 to 10% of the compressive strength okay so if the compressive strength is 30 mega pascal okay the tensile strength will be between 2.5 to 3 okay mega pascal so it is not that good in tension okay but very good in compression so yeah so this is generally how we you know uh, we design uh, the rcc specimens okay reinforced concrete specimens say for example uh, this all you have um, you must have studied in strength of material and uh, this one structural analysis so if the load is acting here okay so this is a bending moment okay so here will be p by 2 p by 2 reactions developing so the bmd will be bending moment diagram will be pl by 4 so if you see this is the maximum moment okay which is being acting here so we have to uh, the strength of the beam should be such that it can uh, you know withstand this maximum uh, moment okay maximum moment so the moment carrying capacity should be um, uh, higher than the uh, moment which is acting so we will be designing uh, uh, we will we'll take examples also in the coming uh, lectures so yeah so like this we have to uh, you know approach uh, this design and this is a section cross section okay so if we you know uh, if we take biaxial strength if we uh, if we apply you know loads uh, at both the uh, you know both the planes okay f1 at the y direction f f2 at the uh, x direction and if we then plot okay we will see something like this because tension is you know only 8 to 10% of the compressive strength right so it will be if, if we say for example if we divide uh, the, by the compressive strength okay uh, all the values we will see is that the curve is something like this okay because uh, you know this will be only 10% 8 to 10% well this will be around uh, this one uh, like it will be uh, you know 100% so basically uh, it will be very good in compression as i mentioned and not that good in tension so yeah apart from that uh, there are a few more terms which we will get, we will be considering uh, in design uh, one is creep okay so creep is uh like uh, basically the time uh, dependent uh, deformation okay uh, which is gradually decreasing in nature and we will see now uh, how it is formed so yeah observation is both axial and bending de bending deformations of reinforced concrete members increase with time okay so that is obvious uh, more like axial uh, due to axial and bending deformation of rcc Uh, you know due to various loads the axial and bending deformations of our rc structures rc uh, uh, members will uh, definitely increase with time so if you see uh, say for example this is the instantaneous deformation okay uh, it could it could have been here also here also uh, they have just taken a you know uh, assume this line okay after say 1 hour so this is the instantaneous value but after that it will be gradually de decreasing okay the deformation so this deformation basically okay this deformation it is basically the creep okay so this is the basically the creep and it is mainly occurring under constant load okay and this is the instantaneous deformation which is basically non recoverable okay so this is the instantaneous deformation which is non recoverable deformation and from here it is the creep okay so this is basically uh, that deformation after the instantaneous okay uh, deformation which is uh, basically dependent on time and uh, you know it decreases it is decreasing in nature under constant load so yeah so this is what it is all about so the total deformation is divided into two parts okay an initial instantaneous deformation that occurs with the application of load which is this as we discussed just now and the second is the time dependent deformation okay uh, that is the creep okay and it continues at a decreasing rate for a period of years so this is a time dependent deformation okay and it it is decreasing in nature okay it is the slope is decreasing in nature so uh, it will be decreasing uh, continue to decrease with the time period increase in time period and yeah it is time dependent okay so this is basically the creep okay apart from that there is also a, one more term which is basically shrinkage so shrinkage basically occurs uh, because of the uh, pores okay uh, the gel uh, the pores occupied by water the gel pores okay which basically of evaporate okay so uh, because the moisture of evaporates the concrete volume shrinks because there is gap in the, inside the paste or concrete so it will shrink 
the shortening per unit length associated with the reduction in volume okay due to moisture loss is basically termed the shrinkage strain or uh, shrinkage so uh, what is uh, shrinkage all about it is the uh, you know shortening per unit length associated uh, with the reduction in volume due to moisture loss okay uh, that is the evaporation uh, and uh, which due to which the volume of concrete will shrink okay so that is basically the shrinkage strain or shrinkage so now if we consider you know uh, this uh, this is a basically a cantilever okay so cantilever beam basically so if we consider this cantilever beam and uh, this can be you know depicted in structural uh, this one in structural form as this one okay so it can be represented as straight line and a, uh, a, a, this uh, joint can be represented here fixed joint and this is a straight line so yeah so these these are uh, like basics of structural analysis and uh, strength of materials so if we if we apply load here p okay so they are basically these are the possible uh, outcomes of this load which can be generated okay one is the axial load which can be generated here one is the bending one is shear and other is torsion okay so these are the possible uh, scenarios which can come arise when there is a load p acting at a length l okay from the fixed uh, end okay so in a cantilever beam okay so if we consider this case basically there will be only two cases developing one is bending as you can see from the bending moment diagram and other is shear okay which is this one okay sfd shear force diagram axial will not be developing because for axial unit uh, horizontal load okay as with the line and for torsion okay torsion uh, this p load has to be uh, it should be acting at an axis which is at a distance from this line okay it can be directly at the line okay so it is mainly torsion is mainly the twisting load so if directly it is occurring at the beam itself there will be no twisting okay? so basically bending and shear are the two uh, outcomes okay of uh, reactions which is of which has occurred due to the uh, application of p load at a distance l in the cantilever beam from the fixed end so this is just an example okay uh, just a uh, general brief discussion of what we are uh, you know what we will be facing in the coming lectures okay so this is just an introduction uh, there are a few more introduction uh, course lectures before we go into the main course so let now let us go into the various design uh, methods okay of rc structures so there are various design methods and they have evolved over time okay so the basically the various methods of design uh, which have been used uh, in concrete uh, design are this okay first initially it was working stress method second it is the load factor method third it was uh, it is a strength and serviceability method and fourth which is which is uh, used currently which we will we, we will be using basically it is the limit step method okay so these are the various uh, these are the four methods uh, of design which has been uh, you know uh, which have been which have evolved over time and this is the latest one limit step method which has been used by everyone and even the is code okay is 456 basically the bible of reinforced concrete design so that is also basically using the limit step method okay so let us have a brief review of all these methods okay in a very brief manner in a summarized manner so first is the working stress method so this method basically evolved around 1900 okay and that mainly used the ratio uh, of elastic modulus of steel and concrete okay which is basically the modular ratio okay es by ec okay so uh, if you consider this uh, say for example this is the loading case this is a uh, simply supported beam uh, which is having a p load in the between so this will be definitely be the um, bmd okay so now as per this equation okay which is uh, coming from the elastic beam theory okay you must have uh, studied this in uh, strength of materials okay so as per this uh, if you consider here so you will get the value of m okay uh, this m value it is around 0 0.167 f bd square okay so this uh, if you see this this is the capacity of the uh, the moment carrying capacity of this beam okay so this is 0.167 fbd squared okay so this is basically the uh, 
uh, yeah it is basically the strain carrying capacity of the beam okay so one more thing uh, is that uh, this uh, this is the this f is the permissible uh, you know uh, this f is basically the permissible stress okay so the moment carrying capacity which we, which we will uh, you know obtain using this uh, this value okay this should be higher than this uh, you know the uh, the act, load acting okay the moment acting okay so this m value should be greater than this m value okay so this is basically we will get into uh, we will know more when we you know design okay when we go into design actually so one uh, the other thing is that uh, basically uh, ideally this is the depth okay this is the width this is the depth ideally okay but in reinforced concrete design okay we generally don't take the depth from the top to the bottom okay uh, we basically take the uh, depth from the above okay that is from the compression side okay the top of compression side till the mid uh, you know the tensile the mid uh, mid point of the tensile reinforcements okay so that is basically the depth okay and this depth is known as the effective depth not the actual depth okay if we if we would have considered actual depth it would have been from here to here but because we are considering effective it will be here to here so this portion this is basically the factor of safety okay which we were which we are taking okay so this is increasing the fos factor of safety so in this method okay working stress method there are a few assumptions one is both steel and concrete will act together okay so both are acting together and secondly it will be perfectly uh, elastic at all stages of loading okay so we will consider the e value as constant for all the stages of loading okay and apart from that the factor of safety in concrete okay it was taken to be 3 okay if we considered uh, the strength uh, if we are testing uh, in a cube strength okay uh, if we are testing the compressive strength in a cube so the factor of safety will be taken as 3 and the uh, you know uh, the factor of uh, safety for steel will be taken as 1.8 okay with respect to the yield strength so fy is the value of importance here and here is the fck okay or fc so 3 and 1.8 were the values considered for factor of safety in working stress method but why this method you know uh, the use of this method diminished okay because it has various defects the first defect was it only dealt with the elastic behavior of the member okay so it did not consider the non-elastic okay behavior so that mean uh, that meant that it was we had to always overestimate okay uh, we had to overestimate we we had little like less confidence on this structure because we thought that the member would collapse just after reaching the elastic limit okay so the non-elastic uh, you know region did not have any significance so that that resulted into uneconomical construction okay so that was one defect second defect was that it resulted in a larger percentage of compression steels definitely because we did not have much confidence in uh, this one concrete okay so uh, and also we needed more uh, capacity because we only considered till the elastic limit so we needed to balance that by taking larger percentage of compression steels okay so steel reinforcement in compression side that is the top side was also required okay so that was uh, the other you know that too unnecessarily okay so it resulted in overestimations that was a problem and third problem was concrete does not have definite modulus of elasticity okay in reality okay so that means uh, the elastic as we all know there the elastic modulus will be constant till the elastic limit but after that it will be always changing but in concrete case it is never constant okay that is only true in case of steel as you as we saw in a few diagrams uh, you know back okay so yeah if you see here so it is never constant okay uh, it, although it is looking a straight line it is it is curvilinear okay so there is no constant elastic modulus value okay so we generally take the initial tangent or sec, uh, you know second uh, modulus or something like that as the ec value but there is you cannot say that to be constant because at any point if you draw tangent it will always be different okay so uh, that was the uh, these were the main problems with the working stress method okay so uh, we basically took the ec value as 25000 newton per mm square in uh, working stress method but that is not constant okay so that was its uh, one of the defects so now let us come to the load factor method okay 
so this method was introduced in USA in 1956 and UK in 1957 so one year difference so almost uh, how much 70 years back so uh, yeah so the load in the load factor method uh, the strength of the RC section at working load was estimated from the ultimate strength of the section okay not the uh, the uh, fy value or the elastic uh, limit uh, strength okay so not it was not basically the yield strength okay it was basically the ultimate strength okay so that working stress was basically related with yield strength and a load factor method is basically was basically related with ultimate strength okay? the load factor is the ratio of the ultimate load the section can carry to the working load it has to carry okay so this was the uh, you know uh, this uh, uh, this was a load factor that was taken into consideration okay so it should always be greater than one okay and uh, reasons towards ultimate strength design was that reinforced concrete sections behave inelastically at high loads uh, which is obvious uh, and we has been obtained from research and ultimate strength design allows a more rational selection of the load factors okay so you can find out the load factor by dividing the ultimate strength by the working strength okay so you can select uh, as per requirement uh, based on the various load factors generated. The stress strain curve for concrete is non-linear as we just saw and is, it is time dependent okay? because there are many factors evolving like creep, shrinkage and all. So it is uh, non-linear and time dependent. So that was the basically the load method, okay? load factor method. So third is the design for strength and serviceability. Okay? So here, if sections are designed by ultimate strength requirements alone, the cracking and deflections at the service loads may be excessive. Okay. So if we are taking ultimate strength, okay, it has also one, but it, it has also one defect. Okay, problem. The problem is uh, because we are taking ultimate strength, there will be ultimate cracking and deflection. So it will be maximum. Okay, maximum cracking and deflection. So at the service loads only, it will be excessive. So it is necessary to keep the crack widths and deflections within reasonable limiting values. Okay. So we needed also some uh, parameters, okay, uh, through which we could control the widths and deflections. That that was basically done in design, uh, design as for strength and as per strength and serviceability. So it could be said to be a, uh, you know, a subset of uh, the ultimate uh, load, uh, the load method, okay, load factor method. Uh, the thing is that it had some restrictions, okay. So the the limit of crack width, deflection, and all. So there were limiting values. And the, la the last and the latest which has been used uh, is the limit state method, okay? So, according to it, a limit state corresponds to each of the states in which the structure becomes unfit, okay? So, this limit state, it is not only based on uh, one load or something, okay? There are various loads, okay? Various types of, as we consider, as we saw just now, it was, uh, there are axial loads, shear load, uh, moment, torsion, uh, torsion and various other loads are there so these are the main so the the limit state corresponds to each of the states okay and they try to find out the uh, the, uh, the the point at which uh, the structure will become unfit at each of the states okay uh, in axial in compression in tension in torsion etc okay in moment flexor so yeah so limit states and also in serviceability okay so limit states may be classified in the two broad categories okay one is strength here and other is serviceability okay so serviceability is basically the limit set of failure okay with respect to deflection and cracking so serviceability is basically deflection and cracking okay and the strength limit state okay that is the limit set of failure in respect of strength it is mainly in shear flexure torsion bond or combined effects and there is also axial okay so axial, shear, flexure, torsion, and bond or combined effects. Basically four, okay? Shear, flexure, torsion, and axial, okay? And if we consider this also, so it is important, good, okay? Bond or combined effects. So as much as you can take, it is better, but basically we design for uh, axial, shear, flexure, and torsion, and in serviceability, deflection, and cracking, okay? So uh, there is one more term in uh, with respect to compressive strength, okay? Which is called a characteristic strength, okay? So, this is basically the characteristic compressive strength. If we write compressive strength as Fc, the characteristic compressive strength is Fck. Okay? So, the, it is the strength okay, that one can safely assume for materials. Okay? And uh, 
so it is basic some basic criteria okay so it we can say it to be a characteristic compressive strength only when it can safely assume uh, the strengths can be safely assumed for materials okay and that is basically achieved how uh, as per is 456 uh, it is achieved when the value of the strength of the material okay uh, is achieved 95% okay at least 95% times that means uh the value of the strength of the material below which 5% of the test results are expected to fall say for example if you are taking 30 megapascal as the characteristic compressive strength that means if you if you cast 100 150 mm cubes and try to find out its compressive its compressive strength 95 at least 95 cubes will have compressive strength more than 30 megapascal or equal to 30 megapascal okay only 5 or less than 5 okay are be are to be found below uh this one 30 megapascal okay so that is the expectation of ca ca characteristic compressive strength if that condition is met then we can say the that the fck value is that value okay 30 say for example uh, if we are designing for 30 megapascal so that is char characteristic strength similarly there is characteristic load okay it is the maximum working load that the structure has to withstand and for which it is to be designed is called the characteristic load so this is for safety purpose okay it should uh, the value below which only 5% is expected to fall that is the compressive characteristic compressive strength uh whereas in characteristic load it is a maximum working load that the structure has to withstand and for which it has to be designed okay so that is the characteristic load okay it is the maximum working load okay for designing and through which the structure uh, for which the structure can withstand so which you will be designing okay in the coming lectures courses so yeah so there are various loads okay uh, as i mentioned uh, in the first lecture itself so basically for buildings we consider these four loads one is dead load live load wind load and earthquake load okay so these four loads are the main loads we consider for uh, our uh, this one design so how to uh, this one how to find out the uh, factored load okay so factored load is found by the uh, multiplying the characteristic load okay into the partial safety factor for load okay so characteristic load is the maximum load okay which we have to design and the building can withstand again we have to multiply that with some partial safety factor for the load okay so that is the factored load so we always design for the factored load so that is giving maximum safety okay so this partial safety factor okay for load so it can be calculated as per this tables okay which have been provided at provided in uh, this one uh, is uh, 875 part 5 and also i think in is uh, 456 the main tables have been mentioned so as per ultimate limit state okay these are the combinations okay if we consider dead load plus live load we have to take 1.5 dead load into dead load plus 1.5 into live load if uh, uh, the combination is dead load plus wind load okay and their dead load is also helping in stability okay it is contributing to stability so we can re even reduce then uh, reduce the partial safety factor less than 1 also so it will be 0.9 dead load plus 1.5 wind load because uh, the uh, dead load is itself helping in stability but if it is not if it is against stability okay if it is helping as uh, overturning so we have to increase the dead load okay so that uh, the concrete structure is able to withstand that effect okay so then it will be 1.5 times dead load plus 1.5 times wind load okay so that is for uh, this one dead load live load and wind load okay but only two taken at a time okay if we take all the three then the partial safety factors become 1.2 1.2 and 1.2 so it will be 1.2 dead load plus 1.2 live load plus 1.2 wind load okay on the other hand if we uh, say if we see in uh, if we uh, try to add earthquake load okay instead of wind load then we will see that the dead load plus live load will be 1.5 dl plus 1.5 ll okay on the other hand if uh, in case of uh, dl plus ll if dl is helping in stability it will be 0.9 dl plus 1.5 dl like the case of like in the case of wind but if it is uh, you know oppositely it is uh, not helping in stability it is helping in overturning so then we have to take extra which is 1.5 dl plus 1.5 el okay and if we take all the three together it will be similar to wind load it will be 1.2 dl plus 1.2 ll plus 1.2 el okay so that is for 
load uh, partial safety factors for load in ultimate limit state okay so this is ultimate limit state for load okay but in the case of limit state of serviceability this is mainly for strength okay in the case of serviceability it will be little different okay so almost same but uh, the partial safety factors will be a little bit uh, you know there and here so if it is uh, dl plus ll it will be 1 plus 1 okay 1 dl plus 1 ll if dl plus wl and dl is uh, you know helping in stability it will be 1 dl plus 1 wl but if dl is not helping it will again be same 1 dl plus wl so the helping not helping is not affecting anyway okay uh, in the case of uh, this one load for partial uh, in case of uh, in case of taken together okay in uh, the serviceability it will be 1 dl plus 0.8 ll plus 0.8 wl okay and in case of uh, this one uh, your uh, when earthquake load is taken together okay in uh, serviceability so it will be 1 dl plus 1 ll okay uh, if dead load and live load is taken if dead load is helping in stability it will be 1 dl plus 1 el and if it is not helping in stability still it will be 1 dl plus 1 el so you can say that wind load and earthquake load almost uh, the uh, combinations are same okay but the difference is that we cannot we only take wind load or earthquake load at a time okay so we will be definitely taking dead load live load always okay and we can add with them a wind load or earthquake load okay but we will never be taking wind load and earthquake load together okay there will be maximum three okay two or three combinations not more than only uh, at one combination it will be a maximum of only two factors or three factors uh, there will be never be four okay the wind and earthquake will never be acting together because uh, they are almost very less you know almost there it is very rare okay earthquake and wind uh, acting together it has been found that uh, it does is generally does not occur uh, that wind and earthquake are acting at the same place at the same time okay so that's why we don't take dl plus ll plus el plus wl only two or three loads are taken together okay so with this we will come to the end of uh, the first week uh, course uh, course content okay so that was the summary of the course now let us uh, start the uh, problem solving session okay so we will briefly discuss a uh, few problems okay and we'll try to understand uh, the course better uh, the first week content better so let us take the first question okay so here uh, the question is match list one and list two okay using the options given okay so we have to match okay so first is the indian standard code for criteria for earthquake resistant design of structures okay so which code is it is okay so as i have told you this code is basically is 1893 okay so that is the uh, that is a is three okay so it will be either a c or d so then second is Indian standard code of practice for design loads other than earthquake for buildings and structures. Okay. So uh, this is uh, earthquake uh, Indian standard code for practice for design load. So design load is basically the code is IS875. Okay. Uh, from part one to part five. So yeah. So that is basically IS875 1987. So it will be B2. Okay. So B2. So it will be the option will be A or C correct one okay third is indian standard code for plain and reinforced concrete okay so that is as i told you that is a bible code for reinforced concrete design so that is uh is 456 2000 okay so c is one okay so basically i think uh, this is the uh, correct option and last is uh, your code of practice for pre-stress concrete okay so pre-stress concrete is not included in our design our course but if we say so, uh, this uh, it is basically uh, this one IS one three four three. Okay, so code for practice uh, of pre-stress concrete is IS one three four three two thousand twelve. So it is basically D five. So one A will be the correct option. Okay, A three B two C one D five. So as you can see, A is the correct option. So as I told you, uh, the Indian standard code for criteria for earthquake resistance uh, resistant design of structure is IS one eight nine three. The Indian standard code of practice for design load other than earthquake for building and structure, it is IS875. Indian standard code for plain and reinforced concrete, it is IS456. 
and Indian Standard Code for Pre-Stress Concrete, it is IS-1343-2012. So this maybe is the latest version. So yeah, so these are the options, as I told you, and you can refer it here uh, for proper more information. So that is what the fir uh, first question. So let us go to the second question. Consider the following statements. One, the stress strain curve of concrete is linear and time dependent. Two, concrete does not have a definite modulus of elasticity. Three, the reinforced concrete uh, sections behave elastically at high loads. Four, the time dependent deformation at constant loading is known as creep. So, which of the following statements is or are incorrect? A3 only, B2 and 4, C1, 2 and 4, D1 and 3. Okay. So, we need to find out which of the above statements are not correct. Okay. So, if you see here properly, uh, the stress strain curve of concrete is never, never linear, as I just uh, mentioned in the class, uh, in the uh, slide, few, few minutes back. So, this is not correct. So, one is definitely incorrect. Two, con concrete does not have a uh, definite modulus of elasticity. That is true. So, two is correct. Three, the reinforced concrete sections behave elastically at high loads. So, this is incorrect. It is always behaving inelastically. So, one and three are incorrect. Okay. And the time dependent deformation and constant loading is known as creep, okay, which is uh, reducing in nature. So this is correct. So one and three is incorrect. So D will be the correct option. Okay. So as you can see, D is the correct option. And you can refer to these lectures okay, for understanding it better. So let us go to the third question. The following statements are with regard to the usage of coarse aggregates in reinforced concrete. One, the nominal maximum size of coarse aggregate should be smaller than 1 by 4 of the minimum thickness of the member. 2. One size aggregate should be used for construction. 3. Well graded aggregates should be used for construction. 4. For heavily reinforced concrete members, the nominal maximum size of the aggregate should be either 5 mm less than the minimum clear distance between the main bars or the minimum cover to the reinforcement, whichever is smaller. Which of these statements is or are incorrect? Okay. A. 2 only. B1 and 2, C1, 3 and 4, D3 and 4. Okay. So, uh, <clears throat> here we have to find out the incorrect statements uh, as per the usage of, with regards to the uh, usage of coarse aggregates in reinforced concrete. Okay. So, nominal maximum size of coarse aggregate, okay, it, it, it is always smaller than 1 by 4 of the maximum thickness of the member. Okay. It should always be less than one fourth of the minimum thickness of the member so this is correct okay one is correct two one size aggregate should be used for construction so this is wrong okay so this is incorrect because if we use one size aggregate there will be a lot of spaces okay so a lot of voids will be there that will result in less strength okay as well as reduction in strength and serviceability okay? so two is incorrect well graded aggregate should be used for construction this is correct because well graded aggregates result in proper bonding and strength okay and for, for heavily reinforced concrete members, the nominal maximum size of the aggregate should be either 5 mm less than the minimum clear distance between the main bars or the minimum cover to the reinforcement, whichever is smaller. So it is it should be always less. Okay? Nominal maximum size of the aggregate should be always less than at least, uh, you know, 5 mm, it should be less than the minimum clear distance between the main bars or cover to the reinforcement. Okay, So that is a nominal cover. Okay or clear over so it, will, it should be always 5 mm less so 4 is also correct okay so only incorrect is the second second uh, line okay second uh, uh, second statement so one size aggregate should be used for construction that is incorrect so a is the correct option okay a2 only is the correct option so as you can see a is the correct option so yeah so according to as professors the aggregate sh size should be fitting enough in no case greater than one fourth of the minimum thickness of the member, provided that the concrete can be placed without difficulty, okay, so as to surround all uh, reinforcement thoroughly and fill the corners of the form, okay. So, yeah, so uh, statement one is correct. Well, <coughs> the second, uh, second one, well graded aggregates offer filling effect, okay, uh, within one another and hence improves the packing, okay, so as we discussed. So, therefore, three is correct. And therefore, because well graded is better, uh, this one size aggregate should not be used. Okay, so hence statement two is incorrect. And for heavily reinforced concrete members, as in the case of ribs of main beams, nominal maximum size of the aggregate should uh, usually be restricted to 5 mm less than 
the minimum clear distance between the main bars or 5 mm less than the minimum cover to the reinforce, uh, reinforcement whichever is smaller as I just discussed okay so statement 4 is also correct okay next question uh, fill in the blanks uh, by matching list 1 to list 2 okay using the options given so first list 1 is that the maximum size of aggregate that can be used for a slab of minimum thickness of 120 mm is uh, <coughs> So as we know, uh, as we just discussed, so it should be, uh, you know, it should not be greater than one fourth of the minimum thickness. Okay, so minimum thickness is 120 mm. So yeah, the one fourth of 120 will be 30 mm, right? So the maximum size of aggregate will be 30 mm. So A, the option is four. Okay, so either of A, B, or C will be correct. Okay. The second question, a concrete of nominal mixed proportion of 1 is to 1.5 is to 3 will exhibit a strength of dash mega Pascal after 28 days of curing. So, yeah, so 1 is to uh, this one, 1 is to 2 is to 4 was for M15, 1 is to 1.5 is to 3 is for uh, 20, M20, okay. And I think 1, 1 is to 1.5 is to 2.5 is M25. So, 1 is to 1.5 is to 3 is definitely M20, okay. So, 3 will be the correct option. So, B will be 3. So, either of B or C will be the correct option. Okay? Third, the minimum diameter of HYSD bars is dash. So, HYSD basically stands for high yield strength deformed bars. Okay? So, yeah. So, for uh, for high yield strength deformed bars, the minimum diameter is taken as 8 mm. Okay? 8 millimeter. So, 2 will be the correct option. Okay? C2. So, basically, A4, B3 and C2. Okay? So, B option will be the best option it will be the correct option okay so option b okay so as you can see b is the correct option and these are the hints so minimum thickness is 1 by 4 into 120 equal to 30 mm 1 is to 1.5 is to 3 is a nominal mix of m20 with a characteristic strength of 20 megapixel and you can refer this lecture and the minimum diameter of high yield strength deformed bars is uh yeah 8 mm okay so fifth question, the characteristic strength is defined as the strength of material below which A, not more than 95% of the test results are expected to fall, B, not more than 10% of the test results are expected to fall, C, not more than 15% of the test results are expected to fall, D, not more than 5% of the test results are expected to fall. Okay. So uh, if you can see here. Uh, we discussed what is characteristic strength, okay? So, as per IS456, characteristic strength is that strength below which uh, only 5% of the results are expected to fall, okay? So, 5%, okay? So, that means not more, to more than 5%, okay? So, not more than 5% of the test results are expected to fall, okay? So, yeah, so the characteristic strength is defined as the strength of material below which not more than 5% of the test results are expected to fall. So, D is the correct option, okay? So as you can see, D is the correct option. So you can refer to this lecture for more detail. So yeah, sixth question is, as per the provision of code IS456-2000, the modulus of elasticity of concrete mix M25 is 22,500, 25,000, 25,700, or 28,500, okay? So as per the provision of IS456-2000 code, okay, uh, the modulus of uh, elasticity of concrete, okay, that is basically the instantaneous modulus of elastic elasticity. So it is calculated as 5000 root FCK, okay, where FCK is the value of characteristic compressive strength, okay. So 5000 root FCK is the formula. So if you see here, characteristic compressive strength is 25 megapascal, okay. So therefore, the modulus of elasticity value E will be 5000 root 25, okay. So square root of 25 is 5 and 5000 into 5 is 25,000. Okay? So yeah, 25,000 megapascal will be the modulus of elast instantaneous modulus of elasticity of concrete. Okay, uh, not instantaneous. It will be uh, short term, okay? short term modulus of uh, elasticity. So yeah, so it will be 25,000. Okay, so B. So B is the correct option. So as you can see, B that is 25,000 is the correct option. And this short term modulus of elasticity is given by E equal to 5000 square root of FCK. Okay? So FCK is characteristic strength of concrete and here it is given as 25 Newton per mm square. So E value will be 5000 into square root of 25 which is equal to 25000. Right? So yeah, 
सेवन क्वेश्चन वर्केबिलिटी ऑफ कॉन्क्रीट इज मेजर्ड बाय ए फिका टेम्परेटर्स टेस्ट बी स्लम टेस्ट सी मिनिमम वॉइड मेथड डी टेलपोर्ट रिचार्ज टेस्ट ओके सो व्हिच ऑफ द टेस्ट और मेथड्स आर यूज्ड फॉर मेजरिंग वर्केबिलिटी ओके सो इफ वी इफ यू रिमेंबर इन द बिगिनिंग ऑफ द डिस्कशन आई जस्ट मेंशन सो वर्केबिलिटी एंड कंसिस्टेंसी ओके व्हाट आर फॉर नॉर्मल कंक्रीट इट इज मेजर्ड इन स्लम टेस्ट यूजिंग स्लम टेस्ट ओके so slum test is basically used for measurement of concrete workability as well as consistency right so b option will be the correct option so yeah so the b option is the correct option right so if you refer to this lecture you will find that workability of concrete is measured by slum cone test okay compaction factor test also and the slum cone test is uh, used for medium workability test okay so that is the widely used normal concrete uh, which was around 35 to 75 mm slum okay so for high work high workability it is not accurate so there we go for floatable test okay so that is like you uh, allow the concrete to flow okay but that is not used in normal concrete okay and in concrete uh, slum cone test the slum values vary from uh, 0 to mm to 300 mm because the height is 300 mm right so that was the seventh question so now let us go to the eighth question so in rcc design which of the following loads is not considered with earthquake load okay a imposed load b live load c snow load d wind load okay so in reinforced concrete design uh, as i mentioned you just now uh, we can use combinations of uh, you know impo see imposed load and live load are the same okay? almost the same so we can uh we can use this with earthquake load okay we can also maybe use the snow load with earthquake load but uh we don't use wind load as per is 456 we don't use wind load with earthquake load okay because uh both instances occurring at the same time is very rare okay so therefore uh, for pro economical section uh, design we don't use earthquake and wind load together okay so wind load is not considered with earthquake load okay as per rcc design of is 456 okay so d is the correct option so d is the proper option correct option as you can see so from the table given in code is 456 as i just uh, we just discussed we can see that code recommend using either wind load or earthquake load at a time okay not both together because the chances of occurring both together are very rare okay ninth question okay the total shrinkage strain for concrete as per is 456 2000 can be taken as 0.0035 a b 0.0005 c 0.0003 d 0.0030 so which is the correct option okay so if you uh, study is 456 2000 okay so as per that 0.0030 is the total shrinkage strain for concrete okay so it, it is taken as 0.0003 Uh, I forgot the clause, but it is mentioned in IS 456 2000. Okay, so the total shrinkage strain for concrete as per IS 456 2000 can be taken as 0.003. So C is the correct option. Okay, so as you can see, C is the correct option. So yeah, so here it is mentioned as per IS 456 clause 6.2.4.1. So this is the clause basically. In the absence of test data, the approximate value of the total shrinkage strain for design may be taken as 0.003. Okay, so this. 0.003 is the value of shrink total shrinkage strain uh, taken uh, for design of concrete in absence of test data as per clause 6.2.4.1 okay and this is the last question for today so yeah so for tubes casted with m30 concrete okay what number of tubes okay uh, out of 300 may have the 28 day strength more than 30 megapascal okay so is it a all b295 uh c290 uh d285 so if uh, we have cast 300 cubes okay of m30 concrete okay after 28 days okay how many of them should have strength more than 30 megapascal okay if uh, m30 is the because 30 is the characteristic compressive strength so uh, out of 300 how how many should have uh, strength more than 30 megapascal okay may have like it should have at least how many should have strength more than 30 megapascal so at least 95% should have more than 30 megapascal okay 95% of the cubes okay as per the characteristic compressive strength uh, definition provided by the is 456 so if you see 95% of 300 it will be 285 okay 
so it will be 285 so for cubes casted with m30 concrete 285 number of cubes out of 300 may have the 28 days strength more than 30 megapascal okay so d is the correct option basically okay so as you can see uh, d is the correct option right so the correct as we discussed multiple times now uh, the characteristic strength is defined as the strength of material below which not more than 5% of the test results are expected to fail, okay? In other words, more than 95% of the test results will pass, okay? So, 95% of the test results will pass only if, uh, you know, 5% uh, or less than that are expected to fail. So, for 300 cubes, only 285, uh, like at least 285 cubes will have strength at least equal to more than that, okay? As per the characteristic compressive strength definition, okay? So, yeah, so with this, we come to the end of today's discussion, okay? So, we will meet you, uh, well, I shall meet you next class, okay? So, till then, have, uh, you know, have, today have a good day and best of luck, okay? Let's meet next, next time. Thank you.